of power, what we are told is at the top of the pyramid of power, presidents, prime ministers, and all these people, um, in the upper echelons of the pyramid, but nowhere near the top, the real people in power are behind them, in the shadows, and these are the conduits, uh, the presidents, the prime ministers, and all the rest of it, for bringing that agenda into the public arena as changes in laws and legislations and the structure of society. So they compartmentalize all these different pyramids within pyramids so that in the end, the banking system is encompassed by a, a pyramid. I mean, a bank's a pyramid in itself, all hierarchical pyramids, but then the banking system is encompassed by a pyramid, and at the top of that are the same families, most notably the Rothschilds. Same with the businesses. The transnational corporations are compartmentalized pyramids in and of themselves, but they go into a bigger pyramid which encompasses all the transnational corporations. So at that point, they are one corporation, just as at that point, all those banks are one bank. Same with politics, education, all these things. And people in this part of the pyramid here, they go to work, they're not trying to manipulate anybody, they're not trying to create a fascist Orwellian agenda and, and, and global state. They just wanna go about their careers, earn money, go on holiday, uh, uh, provide for their families. But they don't know how their apparently innocent contribution individually connects with other apparently innocent contributions around the system. When you connect them together, you see it's anything but an innocent direction that it's taking the world. And uh, that's how they keep uh, what's going on in the hands of the few. This is uh, Neil Haig's representation of that. This is the general population, and these are the kind of uh, dark suit administrators of the system until you get up here to where the control system is. And most of even here won't know that exists. Oh, I've just got this order from an high, I don't know where it's come from. Well, maybe we ought to bloody ask, instead of just doing it. And again, it can also be symbolized as the web, where these various strands, their secret societies, semi-secret uh, organizations, which go out and connect all these apparently unconnected countries, institutions, uh, media organizations, banks, etc. And this Illuminati network, symbolized as the bearded man, spews out all these people who apparently appear to be random. To run for president needs cuckoo land amounts of money. Where do they come from? It comes from here. Where does that money come from? And therefore, you have two people put up for president who are there because of the money provided by this network. Therefore, they've chosen not only who it's going to be, but they've sorted out what the policies are going to be in return for that money. And this is what they do. We think we're choosing our leaders. We're not. It's a myth. And so this structure that I showed you earlier comes into this, where these uh, leaders are put into power to carry out the agenda of the control system, which is why when parties change, whatever they've said in opposition goes out the window and they start acting like the party in government previously that they were criticizing. The common denominator is whoever gets in power basically introduces the control system and whoever's out of power opposes the control system verbally, which means that you have the illusion of choice when whoever's in power unfolds the agenda. So there is no choice. It's a, it's a myth. And they control these institutions and play the people off against each other, divide and rule, both within countries and between countries keeping everything in a constant state of confusion and conflict. And that's the key. Manipulating confusion and conflict is child's play. Manipulating harmony, manipulating respect between each other is a nightmare. So they have to keep the world in constant states of conflict. Now, when you bring it down to an individual country as we come down this structure, this is what you find in every country. You had in America, it's a wonderful example, but it plays out all over the world. During the Bush years, Republican, that administration was controlled by a group of people known as neocons, neoconservatives, including all these people like uh, Richard Pearl and all the rest of it. And over here, you have what I call, anyway, the democons. This is a network of people. I put Kissinger in the Democons because he's an advisor to Obama at the moment, but he spends most of his time with the neocons, Kissinger. He, he just goes with whoever's winning. And the Democons are a group of people that control the Democratic administrations. But the Democons and the Neocons are controlled by the same force once you get to here. So people think, oh, I voted Republican this time. Oh, I'm going to put the Democrats in because I like that Obama. 
got a nice smile. And what you're doing is voting for this, whatever. And that's what's happening in this country. Same thing. And so when people say, Big Brother Bush, or Big Brother Obama, no, it's not. These are just puppets. Dance, I said dance. When I say jump, I mean Olympic high jump record. This is the thing. You take one mask off, you put another mask on. And because it's a different mask, we think it's a different administration. We think controlled by different forces. No, no. And what you have is the movie playing out in the public arena, people who appear to be in opposition to each other when they're controlled by the same puppeteer. And once you look beyond the movie, that's when you start to see what's really happening in the world. So the cards are moved around in line with an agenda for the constant, incessant centralization of power. And it's done with people who, I keep coming back to, have a DNA with empathy deleted, which means anything goes in pursuit of this agenda. And the people are misdirected, diverted by the way society is manipulated and controlled, increasingly so, with more and more laws affecting the fine detail of our lives, so that we spend so much time surviving and rushing around, we don't lift our head up and see what's going on. So puppet people are essential to the few controlling the world. And when we cease to be so, and it's happening more and more, then this will be over. Humans have been put into this round and round and round circular lifestyle with one week leads into another week and another week, just a repeating cycle of action and uh, work and sleep and eat and work and sleep and eat for so many people. And this is the structure that they're moving towards. Why? Because when you're the few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. The more diversity of decision making there is, the less control any central point is going to have over it. So what you need to do is constantly centralize power so control over more and more and more people goes into fewer and fewer hands. We started with a tribal situation a long time ago. The people in the tribe decided what was going to happen. We then brought, as part of this centralization that's gone over at this whole period I'm talking about, the tribes came together into what we call nations. And now, a few people at the center of the nation are dictating to all the former tribes that make up that nation. We're now well into the next stage of that, which is bringing nations together under unions like the European Union, so a few people at the center are now dictating to all those nations which are made up of all those tribes before. And the next stage of that, um, which they're already preparing for, is to take us into a world government that would dictate to these unions that are building up, like the European Union, the American Union that they want via the North American Union, the Pacific Union, evolved out of uh, organizations like APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, and the African Union, already in place, evolved out of the Organization of African Unity and other bodies. And what they uh, uh, done in many of these unions is start them off as uh, free trade zones, just for jobs, that's all it is, no, no, no worries. And then they've turned them into fully fledged dictatorships, which is what happened in the European Union. And the reason is that you've got to centralize power if you want to um, get more and more control in the hands of the few over more and more people. So coordinates. Some of these things I'm going to talk about in this section are quite controversial, but they need bloody saying, so sod it. Um, methods of manipulation, coordinates two. How do they manipulate this? One of the coordinates, one of the methods of manipulation, a massively important one to understand is one I've dubbed problem reaction solution where you want to change society in a way that if you do it openly, you'll get resistance, massive resistance from the population. So what you do is you create a problem covertly, you um, blame someone or something else for it, you pass that fake version of the event through the unquestioning, pathetic mainstream media to the people, unquestioned overwhelmingly and certainly uninvestigated, and you want the people to react to the manufactured problem with outrage, with fear, and you want them to say, do something. What are they going to do about it? At which point you then offer solutions openly with changes in legislation and society and its structure to advance your agenda 
And because of the problem reaction solution, you do not get the resistance here that you would have got without the manufactured problem. 9-11 is a bloody classic. Another way of describing this is ordo ab chao, the Latin motto of the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, order out of chaos, problem, reaction, solution. Create the chaos, then offer the order, your order, your change out of that chaos. So like I say, 9-11 was a wonderful, classic, most blatant example of it. You want to change society, so you create a massive problem. As a result of that problem, you offer the solution, all there, written and ready, the Patriot Act in America and around the world, their versions of it, to change society and to launch a war on terror and an invasion of countries like Afghanistan and, by implication, Iraq. This is Zbigniew Brzezinski, <coughs> President Jimmy Carter's uh, national security advisor and a major mentor going back to the 1980s of Barack Obama. This is what he said in 1997 in his book. Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstances of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. Therefore, we create one, 9-11, and bingo, we then introduce what we say must happen to stop the terrorists. In other words, we change society and advance our agenda, the Orwellian state and all the rest of it. These uh, buildings were brought down because they were made to come down. And similar buildings around the world that burnt for longer and uh, were much more fierce never came down. And these are the only buildings of their kind who've ever come down because allegedly of fire. The official story of 9-11 has just left the room. And I've gone into that in great detail before. I'm just using it as an example of problem, reaction, solution. But when through the web you control the intelligence agencies, you control the governments, you control the media, you control countries, and you control the manipulation of fake terrorists like Osama bin Laden, then you've got all the pieces you need to orchestrate the problem, reaction, solution, and to then use this to change society in the image that you have desired. And this is a classic, Adolf Hitler proposing the creation of the Gestapo in Nazi Germany. An evil exists that threatens every man, woman, and child of this great nation. We must take steps to ensure our domestic security and protect our homeland. Or actually, word for word, what was said after 9-11. The Second World War, problem, reaction, solution. This is why it is no paradox, no coincidence, or contradiction, that the same people can be shown to have funded the Nazis, that funded the Americans, and funded the British, overwhelmingly based around the cartel of the Rothschilds. They created Nazi fascism, they created Soviet communism and the capitalist world. They brought them together in conflict, the second conflict in a very short time. And afterwards, the world was exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally. Something must be done. This can't go on. What are they going to do about it? Ah, gotcha. Because of all this conflict, all this war, it's terrible, terrible. What we're going to do is we're going to centralize power with the United Nations uh, European Union, which was justified in many ways by let's stop European countries fighting among themselves because we'll trade. Well, they stop fighting among themselves because they stop orchestrating it. That's why the Bretton Woods Agreement with the World Bank and all that stuff all came in as a result of the Second World War. Then there's another version, which I now call no problem reaction solution. This is when you don't need a real problem, you just need the public perception of a problem, i.e. weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, i.e. human-caused uh, climate change. And then you can offer a solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist, but if enough people think it does, well, you got them. Totalitarian tiptoe, as I call it, goes in conjunction with problem, reaction, solution. This is real simple. You start at A, you know you're going to Z, but you know if you go in a big leap, the change is going to be so big and so quick that people are going to go, what's happening, what's happening? Turn that television show off, what's happening? And so you go in steps, as big as you can get away with, but not so big that you get too much of a reaction. And as this uh, quite rightly said, you really think it would be this obvious. Well, it's becoming that obvious now as we move along, but up to this point, it hasn't been, unless you looked for it. The European Union, was turned from a free trade zone, nothing to worry about, just for jobs, into what it is now, a centralized dictatorship, through the totalitarian tiptoe. And here is the founding father of the EU, as they call him, Jean Monnet, a Rothschild frontman, 
Europe's nations should be guided towards the superstate without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. And the word fascism, which comes from this symbol, the fasci from the Roman Empire, is individuality tied together and ruled by the accent. The central point, European Union, precisely described. Globalization, which is the constant centralization of power, uh, which is more and more power in the hands of, of, of fewer and fewer over more and more people, this is a, a totalitarian tiptoe. More and more, the globalized economy is taking over so that every country is dependent on every other country, therefore has no power of individual um, action and individual uh, decision-making. Free trade, which means freedom to exploit, which means you can get sweatshop workers here to make your stuff for a few cents, and then you ship it over here and you, you sell it for as much as you can get. It's called free trade. If you want, if you want in favor of free trade, you can't be against free trade. This is also part of this globalized, centralization of power, which is designed to do this, and it increasingly is doing this. It means that if you're dependent within your country or your community on things outside of your influence, then everyone is dependent on everyone else. Therefore, has no self-sufficient ability to make decisions in their own lives, in their own communities, in their own countries. And the reason that they want to do this is they want to make everyone dependent on something outside their control because dependency equals control. It's like abundance and scarcity. We live in a world which could be incredibly abundant. This should, nobody should be hungry on this planet, for goodness sake. Africa could feed the bloody world. It can't even feed itself. Why? Because of the manipulation of that continent by this crowd. And so we have, all over the world, because there's no empathy, no consequences for them emotionally of their actions, we have manufactured scarcity. Because abundance equals choice equals freedom. Scarcity equals dependency equals control. And that's why we have manufactured dependency. We have people hungry in a world of plenty. Coordinate three, the cement. There are certain organizations, networks, rings, that act as the cement that holds the web together and holds people within the web together. Close to the spider people are the Rothschilds. And when I talk about the Rothschilds, one thing I'm not talking about all people called Rothschild. The vast majority of people called Rothschild won't have a clue what other Rothschilds um, in that uh, dynasty are doing. And secondly, I don't even mean only people called Rothschild. I mean the Rothschild bloodline, which has infiltrated many other um, enormous numbers of other families and groups, which then come to power under other names other than Rothschild. Um, because if, if, if hey, the president's Rothschild, the bloody uh, guy here is Rothschild, the, the, the bloody newsreader is Rothschild, what's going on? Instead of that, you have people under different names. So I'm talking about the Rothschild bloodline and the scions of that family, the people that run that family. Not everyone called Rothschilds. A lot of people in that uh, family called Rothschild who don't have a clue what's going on. But they, through these various cements, control all these different and various apparently unconnected organizations. Now, one of the cements, of course, is the Secret Society Network. That's uh, pretty obvious when you look at it. And these are some of the major ones, but there are even more exclusive ones as well that operate in tiny, tiny cabals. But it's not just the secret society networks. They connect into the satanic networks, where they literally carry out human sacrifice and such horrors, which these bloodlines have been doing all the way through. Now, no one has a problem with the fact that then primitive ancients used to sacrifice people and, and, and torture people and all that stuff. But that was at one time kind of acceptable because it was the way they did things. As it's become unacceptable, it's still gone on, same bloodlines involved, but it goes on secretly, obviously. And this is the pedophile rings, the sexual child abuse rings, which connect into that 
and connect into that. That's not saying everyone in a secret society is a pedophile. It's not saying every, every Satanist is a pedophile. It's not saying every pedophile is a Satanist or a member of a secret society. But there are rings, connections between these organizations and groups that um, hold them together. It's a bit like the Olympic rings. They connect into each other. Uh, and you find, this is why, as I researched this over these last 20 years, when I have researched through people in power, like politicians and bankers and even some media people and stuff like that, you know, after this time of researching this and the, the recurring themes, that when you get far enough into it, you're going to come across a secret society, but you're almost certainly going to come across either or, or both, Satanism and child um, abuse, sexual abuse, pedophilia. And there's a reason why the ratio of such people is massive in the upper echelons of this uh, control structure than it is in the general population. There's a blueprint which you find in every community and every country. It's a blueprint of how this works and how the Satanists and the pedophiles um, and the, the secret society people end up in positions of power and influence to direct this conspiracy. So the pedophilia and the secret societies and the, the Satanist operating in these interconnecting rings then infiltrate their people right across the web, which um, holds the, uh, the whole thing together. Now, Satanism is staggeringly common compared with the public perception of it. And there's a number of reasons for it. First of all, they're sacrificing people literally to the gods, the serpent gods. When you, um, you see these, these ancient accounts all over the world of how they used to sacrifice people, young virgins often, and what does young virgins code for? Children. Um, to the gods, because they put them through the sacrifice ritual and they build up the terror. What happens is the terror reaches a point where a certain adrenaline pours into the blood and the people doing the ritual then drink that blood and they get a real high from that adrenaline. But as the sacrifice is going on, the victim is also releasing energy, very powerful, low vibrational energy, and the entities, or entity, whatever it is, just outside of visible light, is feeding off that energy. They're feeding off us like vampires in so many ways, and that's one of them, and one of the reasons for these sacrifices of people to the gods. The other thing is that they, and I've talked to Satanists who've seen this happen, or former Satanists around the world, they create an energetic environment, which is almost a stepping stone like halfway house, which allows these entities to come in to the ritual. I've talked to people who've seen these entities manifest in the rituals because of the way they have created the energetic environment. Uh, anyone who's looked even mildly at this whole conspiracy in this area will know about Bohemian Grove in Northern California, where the elite, the presidents, the Bushes, the Kissingers, the Rockefellers, all these people go and uh, take part in rituals under a 40-foot stone owl. And from what I am told by people who've been there in a victim state, they, in smaller groups, because it's 2,700 acres of redwood forest, actually do sacrifices there too. And all these people are involved with their satanic gods and all the rest of it. But it happens all over the world, and it happens in a sequence to, on certain days. You know, we've got a situation with Halloween where it's now like bloody Christmas. If people only knew what happens on Halloween, what happens across Beltane, May Day, and all that stuff, to kids all over the world, in extraordinary numbers, there would be no celebration of Halloween. And what they're doing on one level, uh, because they're interacting with the, the cycles, the astronomical, astrological cycles, is why they do it at certain times when the, the, the planets, the moon probably, and, and, and everything is in a certain place, is they're manipulating what they refer to as the morphic field, the energy that we all live in. Like I said earlier, if you want to affect the fish all at once, then affect the sea. And in, uh, in, in the new book, in an appendix at the end, I, I uh, publish this, I, I call it um, Confessions of a Satanist. Um, it, was, it came to light early this year, and it is alleged to be, I can't vouch for its authenticity, what I can say is after 20 years of researching this, it's bloody massively accurate. And it's supposed to be a guy who died in 2004, he was a high Satanist in Australia, who, um, he, didn't, he didn't really 
it wasn't really a confession in the sense of I want to confess my sins. It was just basically an outline of, of how Satanism controls the world. And this is one of the things he says in that. What most people do not realize is that Satanism is a ritually based practice and that this repetition, same place, same time, has over time left strong impressions upon the morphic field. They have to control the morphic field so that we stay in a low vibrational state, so we stay attached to that moon matrix I'm talking about. And, and of course, um, as I was saying, we, we are interacting with this field all the time and, and taking in energy into the, the meridian system from it, and therefore it is affecting us. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm saying that this is part of the process of suppressing that field also, which is why they stuck them on vortex points. Now let's take this connection from Satanism, blood drinking, taking in the human genetic code to stay here longer, which is what some of these reptilians do, and the pedophilia. What's it all about? It's about energy. It's about vampiring the energy of children. The reason that we have sacrifice to uh, the gods of young virgins Children is because they want the energy of children before puberty because when puberty happens, there is a, obviously we all know, there is a chemical change, massive chemical change, at which point, from their point of view, the energy is not as pure and desirable. This is what John Juan Matos said in one of the Carlos Castaneda books. Um, he's being quoted here by Castaneda. Matos is, is the he. He explained that sorcerers saw infant human beings as strange luminous balls of energy, covered from the top to the bottom with a glowing coat, something like a coat of plastic adjusted tightly around the cocoon of energy. He said that glowing coat of awareness was what the predators consumed, and that when a human reached adulthood, all that was left of that fringe awareness was a narrow fringe that went from the ground to the top of the toes. That fringe permitted mankind to keep on living, but only barely. And that, although the pedophiles won't realize that, although the elite ones will, is what the pedophilia is all about and why it is so rampant in the upper echelons of this control system. Because while the pedophile is sexually abusing the child, symbolically here, it is connecting into the energy field of the child. This is why they have anal sex uh, with children so much, even girls. It's because they're connecting in to the lower chakra, the base chakra, and they're drawing that energy out, or the, the, the possessing entity is drawing it out and feeding off it. This is why pedophiles tend to be overwhelmingly possessed people, because the, the, the possessing entity um, drives the lust for sex with children, and then when it happens, they draw the energy off it, drawing the child's life force out. And politicians in this control system, again, this is why pedophilia is rampant among the political classes. This is um, what the Satanist confession said as well, that Australian guy. Politicians are introduced by a carefully graded set of criteria and situations that enable them to accept that their victims, children, will be our little secret. Young children sexually molested and physically abused by politicians worldwide are quickly used as sacrifices. In Australia, the bodies are hardly ever discovered, for Australia is still a wilderness. In countries that are not a wilderness, they control the mortuaries and the crematoria where they get rid of children who they want rid of because of what's happened. And it is rampant. I keep using that word, but it is. People don't realize. What happens is people think or relate the number of children that go missing every year to the number of times we see a story on the news that a child is missing and everyone's trying to find them. That is the tiniest, tiniest tip of the iceberg. Hundreds of thousands of children go missing in America every year. I've run the states, because they don't have federal figures, tell you how many cars went missing federally, but not, not children. I said, you've got to ring the states. I rung a, a, a load of states years ago now. I said, how many children go missing every year? How many children went missing last year? And I added the figures up, what? Never seen this on the news, hundreds of thousands. Some of them are found, some of them have explanations. Not all, nothing like. 
And what happens is that you have the cover-up. There are so many stories where the story of this Satanism and this child abuse starts to come to light and immediately the lid goes on because the system controls the various aspects that can keep the lid on. This is just one example. It's endless numbers around the world. The Franklin cover-up. It was an investigation by this guy, John W. DeCamp, who was former state senator in Nebraska, and he started investigating this guy, Lawrence King, a major Republican who sang the um, American National Anthem in um, 1984 and 1988, I think it was, at the uh, Republican convention. And it, he was investigating him for financial fraud through a, a, an organization called the Franklin Savings and Loans. But then he discovered that he's running a pedophile ring and, and, and providing children for the biggest names in America. And he wrote this book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, again, they go together all the time, and murder in Nebraska. And what happened? Some of it got into this Washington uh, Times, a mainstream newspaper, the connection to the Reagan-Bush administration, but most of it was totally covered up. I've been writing in my books now since 1998 that Father George Bush is a notorious pedophile, child torturer, child killer, and serial killer of adults as well. Said it on American radio, still waiting for a response. And, and, and this, this is one example, a, a lady who became a friend of mine, Kathy O'Brien, who was in the American government mind control project since she was a kid. And uh, met, met her many times, she still corresponds with me now and again, and I've met a daughter that she was talking about, lovely, lovely girl, totally shattered by these people. And that's one example of millions and millions that are going on around the world. And this is what she said in a book, Transformation of America. Kelly's bleeding rectum was but one of many physical indicators of George Bush's pedophile perversions. I have overheard him speak blatantly of his sexual abuse of her on many occasions. He used this and threats to her life to pull my strings and control me. The psychological ramifications of being raped by a pedophile president are mind-shattering enough. But reportedly, Bush further reinforced the traumas to Kelly's mind with sophisticated NASA electronic and drug mind control devices. Bush also instilled the who you're going to call and I'll be watching you binds on Kelly, further reinforcing her state of helplessness. The systematic tortures and trauma that I um, endured as a child now seem trite by comparison. They're not. I know what she went through. Uh, to the brutal physical and psychological devastation that George Bush inflicted on my daughter. And that's just one of these people on, uh, uh, involving one of the victims of this. It's incredible, the scale of it, and it's going on in this country. And what happens? The wall goes up. This is what DeCamp found. Suddenly, ranks uh, are pulled in, and the media won't touch it, the uh, uh, social services won't touch it, the police won't touch it, politicians won't touch it. It's the blueprint. It's how it works. And uh, the Discovery Channel program, produced by Yorkshire Television, was about to go to air um, exposing that Franklin cover-up and the, the, the pedophile connections, bingo, it was censored and pulled just before it was going to air. Never to see the light of day, although you can get it on the internet, because one copy survived. I was naming this guy, like I said earlier, Ted Heath, as a pedophile and child murderer from 1998. This guy's record of killing children is extraordinary. Prime Minister of this country. This fellow, Thomas Hamilton, the man who uh, went into Dunblane uh, Primary School and killed 16 children and a teacher, he was a procurer of children for the Scottish political elite, which locks into the Westminster political elite and the satanic rings that lock into both. That's why they uh, took the records of this case and ordered them to be locked away for a hundred years. And then, if you've been following my website recently, and many other websites too, here you have the classic blueprint again. Everywhere you go, same blueprint. This girl, Holly Gregg, Down syndrome girl, her mother, um, Anne, and uh, Robert Green, a fantastic guy who's been helping them and committed so much of himself to this. When she started, uh, Holly started saying what had happened to her, being uh, raped and abused by the Scottish elite, suddenly the wall went up again. 
and Robert was arrested. He's been treated appallingly by uh, the police, the Grampian police in Scotland. Grampian area of Scotland, by the way, notorious for Satanism. And uh, he's now um, basically been told what he can't say and he can't name people and all the rest of it. And he's, um, the case is ongoing. The media won't touch it, though maybe that might be changing, we hope. The, the Scottish law uh, network or establishment will not investigate it. The police won't investigate it properly. Anne's uh, brother, Holly's uncle, was blatantly murdered when he had seen um, Holly's father abusing her and therefore had the ability to, 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 to tell the truth and tell the story. He ended up murdered. Um, and, and a cover story of suicide. When you see the story, suicide, are you kidding, was put together by the Grampian police. And uh, Robert Green is a man who, if there were more of his like in this world, then this world would be a very much better place. And Robert's actually here today. So thank you, Robert, very much for all you're doing. This is how they create the wall. You have, again, the pyramid system. Social services is a pyramid a hierarchical pyramid. The police is, lawyers are, judges are, politicians are, the media are, all of it. The medical side, the, the doctors, the coroner's offices, they're all part of these structures. And up here, they all eventually fuse into the same group, the same ring of people, controlling force. And what they do is they put in these pyramids people in the positions of power who are in the ring or in the, the, the club, you do not have to control everybody in social services to stop investigations or to enforce investigations to take children away for no good reason. You just have to control the level of social services that makes those decisions. And of course, once you're in a position in these pyramids where you are hiring and firing, what you do is you hire people of like mind, and after a period of time, then a lot of these people are in these organizations at different levels. You don't have to control every policeman. There's so many genuine policemen in this world, but they don't get in, into the positions of power overwhelmingly. The geese guys do. And, and therefore, they dictate whether something's investigated or not, or whether someone is targeted to pin them with a charge that is completely unjustifiable. Um, same with the media. You control that. We're not covering that story. Politicians, oh, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm not investigating that. Oh, no. This is how it's done. This is David Berkowitz, uh, the son of Sam Multiple Killer in New York, who from prison after he was convicted said that he, was, he did it, yes, but he was part of a satanic ring that was with him. And he said this quite rightly, Satanists are peculiar people. They aren't ignorant peasants or semi-literate natives. Rather, their ranks are filled with doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and basically highly responsible citizens. They are not a careless group who are apt to make mistakes, but they are secretive and bonded together, the cement, by a common need and desire to meet out havoc on society. It was Alistair Crowley who said, I want blasphemy, murder, rape, revolution, anything bad. And now we're having around the world, not least in this country, but America too and other countries, we're having the state stealing our children on the most extraordinary scale with the most extraordinary excuses. There was one lady who was, uh, came to light, not many do compared with the ones that are going on because of the secret family courts where this stuff goes on in secret and can't be reported. And they say, oh, it's to protect the children. No, it's to protect the pedophiles and the Satanists. That's what the secrecy is for. And this lady, here and her husband, had spent 38,000 pounds on uh, uh, fertility treatment so they could have children. She had twins, uh, I think it was twins, and, and she made a joke when social services came round, when the, the baby came out of, um, out of hospital, and, and she said, oh, it's uh, Bertha's ruined my figure. 
They took her children away. And then when she furiously uh, resisted, they said, the mother has anger problems, which are a danger to the child. It's unbelievable the number of children that have been taken away from their parents for no reason. This guy, Tim Yeo, a conservative MP, uh, just before the last election, said in Parliament, uh, using parliamentary privilege, he accused the, his local council of kidnapping a nine-week-old baby from parents. But it's the tip of an iceberg and a gathering iceberg. All over the world, like I say in the book, I've looked at America as well, it's happening there. And what did Aldous Huxley, Huxley um, the uh, Fabian prophet in Brave New World, talk about? The fact that uh, children were going to be taken away from parents, parents were going to become uh, no longer, not even relevant, they're no longer even part of society, and the state was going to take control and bring up all children. And that is what's, uh, where they're moving towards. And this guy, Ed Balls, my God, whoever named him was, was psychic. Um, <laughs> he was children's minister up to the last uh, recent election, overseeing, taking more and more power away from parents, giving it to schools and authorities. And this guy is a former chairman of the executive of the Fabian Society and still a leading light in it. Coordinates to the cement. Now, this might be controversial. I don't give a damn, really, because, you know, we've reached the point here where we've got to start saying what is and not running away from it. Um, what I'm about to say now... <laughs> what I'm about to say now, virtually no one else, there are some, uh, and some that, are, you know, are, are, some of them are characters I don't really would like to spend an evening with, to be honest, and some are, but... Um, most people, the overwhelming majority of people in what we call conspiracy research, won't touch this subject, right? Well, I'm going to bloody touch it because I'm sick of it. And I'm sick of people being um, frightened and intimidated into not touching it. Thank you. Right. First of all, we, as a human race, have got to get our fricking heads around what this is, because it ain't what we're told it is. It's not about what's right and beneficial for Jewish people. Jewish people are its victims, not its beneficiaries. <laughs> Jewish people have been hung out to dry again and again by this crowd that claim to have their best interests at heart, like hell they do. That's why I call this Rothschild Zionism. It was created by them, it is controlled by them to this minute, and it was created as a secret society within the web to uh, massively contribute to the manipulation and control of our global society and individual countries, etc., etc. It's Rothschild Zionism. Anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, not that anti-Semitism means what we think it does, because Zionism is not about Jewish people. And even in its play-out way uh, or world, it is a political system, a political philosophy. At its core, it is a secret society putting its agents in places of power. One of the very few things that Joe Biden, Vice President of the United States, has ever said, which is true, is you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. Because of the propaganda, we equate Zionism with Jewish people. It's not how it is to a very, very large extent. How many people know this? How many Jewish people around the world are protesting, have organizations created to protest against Zionism? Zionism and Judaism are diametrically opposed. Zionism is state-organized terror. How many times do we see this in the newspapers? Never. End of Zionism equals peace. Israel, stop killing Palestinians. I am Jewish and I want that. Why don't we hear about this? We condemn any Zionist aggression against Iran. I thought every Jewish person in the world wanted to bomb Iran. That's what the media seems to give us an indication about. Another Jew against Zionism. Over and over. Zionist spokesmen do not represent world Jewry. How many people... I thought, I thought Ahmadinejad of Iran is supposed to be the great um, demon of all Jewish people. Ah, look at it. The demonization comes from Rothschild Zionism. We've been totally misled about what it is. 
Rothschild uh, dynasty created Israel. It paid for the first people out of Europe to go and people Israel after the war. It paid for the building of the Knesset. It paid for the building of the Supreme Court building with all its Illuminati symbols all over it. And some of the people who've broken out of the family, I quote one of them in, in my book, have actually said, and as I've been saying for years, because it, it's bloody obvious, that Israel is not the homeland of Jewish people. It is the fiefdom of the Rothschild dynasty, created out of Rothschild Zionism, a secret society. And Rothschild Zionism has been used via Israel to devastate, slaughter, torture an entire nation of human beings while claiming to be against terrorism. This is the dictionary definition of genocide. The systematic and widespread extermination or attempted extermination of an entire national, racial, religious or ethnic group. Never can what is happening in Palestine and Gaza have been described so accurately. More and more people killed through war, killed through bombing attacks, killed through shootings, killed through lack of food and adequate uh, medical care. Gaza the most crowded piece of land on earth is little more, ironically, than a concentration camp. And the world looks on. This is the face of Palestine. Well, tell me what you see, combat boots. Yeah, another terrorist five-year-old. And all the time, Palestinian homes are being demolished in occupied land and given over to these extremist settlers who believe it, they have a right to it because it says so in some bloody Bible. And then we've got this wall, sorry, security fence, which has taken great tracts of Palestinian land, right all against um, international law and all the rest of it. And here is uh, a children's playground being um, sacrificed as the wall continues, sorry, security fence continues its endless way. This green is Palestinian land in 1946. Then we see what has happened since. This is 2000, we're in 2010 now. It's much smaller than that. What was I saying? The systematic and widespread extermination or attempted extermination of an entire national, racial, religious or ethnic group. And I say to these Rothschild Zionists, don't you bloody dare talk about racism of others when you are behind this. Israel is an apartheid society, not just between Israelis and Palestinians, but through um, Israeli society, it's incredibly apartheid. The way they treat the black Jews from Ethiopia is absolutely grotesque, as is spokesmen doing that then talking about other people's racism. We've got to go for that. I mean, and, and people, Jew, Jewish people, have seen it. They can see what it is. There's some fantastic Jewish people in Israel who are resisting this. Young people who go to jail because they won't serve in the army because of what the army's doing to the Palestinians. Magnificent people never get talked about in the mainstream media hardly. And no matter, no matter what is said about Israel, this is Israel's response. Why? Because Israel is the fiefdom of the Rothschild dynasty, which also controls the American administration, the British administration, and so Rothschild's one arm is not going to criticize Rothschild's other arm. In the Matrix movie, there's something called the Zion mainframe. Well, Zionism, Rothschild Zionism, is in so many ways a mainframe of this network. And it pervades all the way through. And it's not about, oh, these Jewish people here and these Jewish people there. It's Rothschild Zionists who are there, and they answer to the Rothschild dynasty. Therefore, they play out the agenda of the web in a coordinated way. Now, before I start this, a lot of names coming up. I'm going to go just through a bit of the American administration and, and a few other things, just to give you a feel for it, for people that haven't seen the extent of this. Before I start, one fact. Jewish people in America 
are less than 2% of the population, a significant number of them will not be Rothschild Zionists, and therefore the ratio of Rothschild Zionists is even smaller, significantly smaller than the 2%. Okay. Obama's immediate handler is a guy called Rahm Emanuel. He has served in the Israeli army. He's the White House Chief of Staff. He does uh, whatever he says. His father, Emanuel's father, was a terrorist in the Ergun terrorist group that bombed Israel into existence in 1948. And uh, this is the relationship between Rahm Emanuel, uh, he's the kind of Peter Mandelson of America, and uh, Obama. Hey. You want a Nobel Peace Prize? I can sort it, son. I can sort it, son. No problem. All, all pictures like that, by the way, are by a guy called David Dees, who's a, a political artist, brilliant, uh, American, work, uh, works out of Sweden. Uses images so powerfully to tell a, a, a thousand words as they go. This guy is the second handler in the White House. His name's David Axelrod, Rothschild Zionist and he um, was the man who orchestrated the entire election campaigns of Obama against Hillary Clinton and then against John McCain. The main funder and orchestrator of the funding in terms of individuals of Obama was a guy called George Soros, Rothschild Zionist who manipulates countries and, and, and uses his networks and funding to create coups in countries where they want to change the regime, regime change. And he bets on currencies, um, like he bet on the pound years ago, and makes a fortune out of the demise of the economy of other countries, because he has no empathy. Henry Kissinger, massive Rothschild Zionist, to serve that dynasty's agenda for uh, 40 years, if not 50 years. And he's now an advisor to Obama, even though he's a, a, officially a Republican. The American economy, the American um, economic team, is led by Timothy Geithner, Treasury Secretary, Rothschild Zionist, and Larry Summers, Rothschild Zionist. The entire Obama budget is run by the budget director, Peter Orzag, Rothschild Zionist. This man was advising the Russian Treasury when the Russian governments were giving state assets uh, away to Rothschild Zionist oligarchs, including Roman Abramovich, the owner of Chelsea Football Club, by the way. It's very easy to become a, a billionaire when a state says, have these assets worth a billion, <laughs> billions of pounds, thank you very much. It's a piece of cake. You could buy a football club if you want. And this man's company was also advising the Icelandic Central Bank in the run-up to the Icelandic crash. The Federal Reserve in America which controls the American economy in so many ways. It's a privately owned, not government owned central bank, and it's privately owned by the Rothschilds and the affiliates of the Rothschilds is Bernard Bernanke, Rothschild Zionist. He replaced Alan Greenspan, Rothschild Zionist, who was ahead of the Federal Reserve from Reagan Bush right up into the Boy Bush um, administration, and he systematically took away the checks and balances which allowed the mayhem of 2008 to unfold. We keep hearing about Goldman Sachs and all the mayhem that it's created, both in the crash of 2008 and the crash of the economy in Greece, fundamentally uh, involved Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is a fiefdom of the Rothschilds headed by Lord Blankfein, Rothschild Zionist. The World Bank, headed by a Rothschild Zionist. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, headed by a Rothschild Zionist. European Central Bank, headed by a Rothschild Zionist. A stream of so-called czars, as they call them in America, controlling different policies and areas, policy areas of the Obama administration, Rothschild Zionists, including Cass Sunstein, who has actually written a paper saying people who have conspiracy theories should either be banned from expressing them or taxed for expressing them. Taxed! Climate change policy in the Obama administration is controlled by Carol Brown, a Rothschild Zionist, and Todd Steen, Rothschild Zionist. Major area of policy. The uh, American administration is utterly awash with Rothschild Zionists, and that is not by accident. It's because they're agents of the dynasty or agents of the control system. It's not about race. Mossad is not the uh, intelligence agency 
of Israel. It's the intelligence agency of the Rothschilds, and that's why it turns up all over the world um, in false flag set up terrorist events and assassinations and all that stuff, because it's not carrying out the policy of Israel, it's carrying out the policy of the Rothschilds that control Israel. Now let's look at 9-11. The World Trade Center lease was purchased just a few weeks before 9-11 by Larry Silverstein, Rothschild Zionist, and Frank Lowy, Rothschild Zionist. And the deal was done with this guy called Eisenberg, Louis Eisenberg, Rothschild Zionist, the head of the New York Port Authority. The head of the CIA who investigated um, what happened on 9-11, George Tenet, Rothschild Zionist. Um, the Patriot Act, which was brought out, the Orwellian Take Your Freedoms Away in, in, uh, Patriot Act in America, was co-authored, justified by 9-11, though it was written before because they knew it was coming, uh, by uh, Michael Shertoff, uh, whose mother was a Mossad agent and who became the second head later of Homeland Security, an organization Orwellian that was justified by 9-11. At the time of 9-11, in the run-up to it, and then the war on terror and all that stuff, the Pentagon was dominated by Paul Wolfowitz, uh, Rothschild Zionist, Dove Zakheim, the comptroller, who managed to lose trillions of dollars and still got away with it. And by the way, when one announcement was made of what, how much he'd lost or, or had gone missing in the Pentagon, they announced it on September the 10th, 2001. I wonder if they realized that because of that, it would never see the light of day. Dove Zakheim, Rothschild Zionist, and people like uh, Douglas Feith or Feith, Rothschild Zionist in the Pentagon. Now, as I've said earlier, the Bush administration was dominated and controlled by what became known as the neocons, the neoconservatives, which were a Rothschild Zionist organization, led by people like Richard Pearl, Rothschild Zionist, William Crystal, Rothschild Zionist, John Bolton, Rothschild Zionist, in belief in nothing, if, if nothing else. And then the 9-11 Commission report, which was the official report investigating 9-11, they wanted Kissinger to uh, head it uh, first until the public he didn't, didn't take that seriously and he had to step down. But that report, which agreed that the official story of 9-11 was true, was written and overseen by Philip Zelico, Rothschild Zionist. The judge, Alvin uh, Hellerstein, who is uh, hearing and overseeing the cases of the 9-11 families, who were taking out lawsuits to try to find the truth of 9-11, etc. Rothschild Zionists making sure that truth never comes out. Think of the ratio I said earlier as I go through this. The man who coined the phrase, he was a Bush speechwriter, uh, the axis of evil, which targeted Iraq before they invaded Iran and North Korea, was David Froome, Rothschild Zionist. So when you look at this, because Israel is the fiefdom of the Rothschilds, you see that this dynamics, or you'd think, is the man of 300 million people, the superpower, is the, is, the, is the most powerful of the two. No, no. He is controlled from there. Because the Rothschilds control them. Do you know Israel has the second biggest F-16 fleet in the world? The biggest outside of America. It's a slither of land. How did they get them? Dub Zakheim, as con controller of the Pentagon, Rothschild Zionist, made a load of uh, weaponry and planes in America scrap when they weren't so they could be passed for a song to Israel. These two guys, they uh, produced a book uh, last year, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy, and they say this, Israel receives about three billion in direct foreign assistance each year, which is roughly one-fifth of America's entire foreign aid budget. In per capita terms, the United States gives each Israeli a direct subsidy worth about $500 a year. This largest is especially striking when one realizes that Israel is now a wealthy industrial state with a per capita income roughly equal to South Korea and Spain. Another writer, a former BBC and ITN journalist, produced a book, Zionism, the Real Enemy of the Jews, and my God, is that true? And he points out, Jewish people make up less than 2% of the American population, but account for 50%, I would say Roth Rothschild Zionists, 50% of the political campaign contributions. And that's why, no matter how these people argue at election time, including this country and others, they're all agreed on one thing. What goes on in Gaza? Keep quiet, keep your head down. And I block that out, because I don't want anyone to see what's behind it. It's horrific. This man, magnificent uh, Israeli, 
called Mordecai uh, Venunu, went to jail for 18 years for revealing the truth that Israel is a nuclear power. He's still got massive um, restrictions on his movement and what he can say. And you know, and, and he announced officially, officially, that he was continuing it. There is an official policy that on, on um, Israel's nuclear weaponry, America doesn't ask and Israel doesn't say. That's an official policy. Iran hasn't even got it yet and they want to invade the bloody place. This lady, Kay Griggs, was married to a colonel in the uh, United States Marine Corps and as a result she was given a tour of the Middle East section of the State Department. There's a video on, on, on the internet where she tells of her experience. And what she says is, um, everywhere she went was Zionist. Everywhere she went was Zionist literature, in, in, in room after room in this department. And eventually she said to one of them, where's the Palestinians? And they're looking after them. And she said, uh, one of them said, ah, oh, we look after that. Palestinians have got no bloody chance. It's a stitch up. The main lobby group in America is called APEC, America Israel Public Affairs Committee, which sounds like an official, but it's a lobby group. It's headed by a guy called Lee Rosenberg, who is a very close friend of him and comes from the same political cesspit that we call Chicago. So when this question is asked, Americans, do you dare to say Israeli terrorism? No, no, because of the way it's uh, controlled, like I say. The Rothschild Zionists control the media and Hollywood. Don't take my word for it. Los Angeles Times columnist Joel Steen, Rothschild Zionist, wrote an article proclaiming that Americans who don't think Jews, I would say Rothschild Zionists, control Hollywood are just plain dumb. I had to scour the trades to come up with six Gentiles in high positions at entertainment companies, but lo and behold, even one of that six, AMC president Charles Collier, turns out to be a Jew. As a proud Jew, I want America to know of our accomplishment. Yes, we control Hollywood. Leading um, Israeli paper columnist said, the Jews, uh, Rothschild Zionist, I would say again, the Jews do control the American media. This is very clear and claiming otherwise is an insult to common knowledge. And what do the media do? They keep the truth from us and keep us diverted from what's really going on. It's an elephant in the bloody living room and people are terrified of going there because they're terrified of being called racist and anti-Semitic and all that. They'll call you anti-Semitic. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit. <laughs> very quickly, it's the same in this country. There was a, a very, very good documentary, and it was a kind of stand back in amazement that it actually got out, by a guy called Peter Oborn, a journalist, um, in the Dispatches um, series on uh, Channel 4 that looked at the uh, Rothschild Zionist control of um, uh, British politics through organizations known as the Friends of Israel. Each party has one, but of course they all connect, so it's actually one uh, network. And again, just like in America, never any criticism. The British government under Tony Blair and much of it under Gordon Brown to the end was controlled by Peter Mandelson, Rothschild Zionist. Note the hands. Rothschild Zionist. He even flaunts it, this guy, goes on holiday with him in all the papers with this leading light of the family Jacob Rothschild. So many Rothschild Zionists end up in government here, like the possible leader of the Labour Party, uh, David Miliband, Foreign Secretary before the election, Ed Miliband, Head of Climate Change and Environment, and this guy, uh, Jack Straw, who's been in so many of the major offices since Blair came to power in 1997. The new Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, Rothschild Zionist. This guy, Tony Blair, was completely controlled by them, as Bush was, which is why they moved as one unit to do what the Rothschilds wanted, which was to invade Iraq and Afghanistan. And to shut people up, the Rothschilds have created organizations like the Anti-Defamation League. They haven't sent me a bloody Christmas card for years, these people. I don't want to have upset them or what. But I'm speaking in New York in October. That could be funny. Um, anyway. They set these organizations up to target those people who are saying the sort of things that I'm saying. The idea is to uh, throw your erasedness at, at people so to shut them up or to discredit them. Like I say, I don't give a shit. You throw it, son, and I'll let the bugger back. Thank you very much. As a result, as a result, when you criticize Israel, you are promoted as criticizing Jewish people and therefore being racist. This is how it works. And I have to say, the robot radicals on the so-called left of politics are played like a violin by these people. 
They go out on their protest, you're an edgy semi. Okay, um, come in and listen to what I'm going to say. No, they never bloody do. And then you get people like the magnificent Norman Finkelstein, who's a Jewish man who's had his academic career destroyed for speaking out. His parents suffered in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany. And when he exposes these frauds and fakes in the Rothschild Zionist movement and what they do against Jewish people in general, he's called a self-hater. They can't say he's anti-Semitic, although they, sometimes they even use that. He's a self-hater. No, he's a decent man doing decent things. You want to try it. And the idea... The idea is to create, and they're doing it, hate laws in which truth is no defense. Even though what you say is true, it's no defense. If people are upset by it, then too bad, you've broken the hate laws. They're now targeting the internet, which has been so magnificent in communicating this information. And who's doing that? In America, Jay Rockefeller, Rothschild Zionist. In this country, up to the last election, he rushed through a bill to this effect just before the election. Peter Mandelson, Rothschild Zionist. And just this week, Obama has nominated this lady, Eleanor Kagan, the Solicitor General, to go to, onto the Supreme Court. Two things. One, that will make Rothschild Zionists making up nearly half the Supreme Court judges of America, four of the nine, when they are well under 2% of the American population. And she is vehemently in favor of laws banning freedom of speech in association with her mate, tax the conspiracy theorist Sunstein. It is a elephant in the living room, and we need to address it if we are going to unravel this cabal, because they don't want to frighten us into not going here for any other reason than they know if we go here, so much is going to unravel. Home straight to tyranny. They think they're on the home straight to tyranny, wishful thinking. This is the man, uh, by the way, David Axelrod, Rothschild Zionist, who orchestrates the words on this guy's teleprompter. He's so welded to it that on St. Patrick's Day, he had a reception for the Irish Prime Minister, and he thanked himself for asking everyone, inviting everyone, because the Irish Prime Minister's autocue words were still on there when Barmer came forward <laughs> to thank everybody. So that's how much he's welded to it assuming levels of knowledge that isn't there. You know, people say Obama's intelligent. He's not. What they're doing is comparing him with Bush. <laughs> and slow horses look fast when they're running past trees. <laughs> we have the secret agenda unfolding, and this is the movie. Bush is in the movie, now Obama's in the movie, but it's the same movie. And he's just there to change and pied pipe of the people, although his honeymoon period was encouragingly short. He's another Tony Blair. Will you lie first, Tony, or shall I? Oh, after you, Barack. Tony Blair. If there's ever a half-truth in a Blair speech, it's a typing error. <laughs> the big change man, Biggest contributors came from Wall Street, Goldman Sachs. His background is full of sleazy businessmen like Tony Resco, who went to prison for fraud, who was a major funder of his political career. Why? Because he's one of the gang. Controlled by Soros, controlled by uh, Brzezinski. Brzezinski is interesting. Uh, Brzezinski has been, like I say, his mentor since the 1980s. And this is what Brzezinski said in a book in 1970. The technotronic era, that which we're in now, involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance on every citizen to maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. This is the man who massively is behind Mr. Change. And he was also the co-founder, co-creator, of an organization called the Trilateral Commission, 
which locks into this network, which I've been writing about for years, uh, a network around a secret society in Britain called the Round Table, including the Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome, their environmental manipulation arm, and the Trilateral Commission as well. And um, interestingly, this is, this is very relevant to current events. In his books and, and his statements, Brzezinski, who's very much, uh, like I say, running the foreign policy of Obama with people like Kissinger, he talks about an area of the world called Eurasia, which is basically from Europe across to China. Now, this is the most significant part of Eurasia on this map. What Brzezinski says, control Eurasia, you control the world, not least because of the uh, massive oil and gas reserves around the Caspian Sea. So we're in a, a process of the cabal wanting to take over Eurasia, and particularly this area. Now look, the number of countries that have been invaded, had regime change, or are now current being targeted. First of all, the Ukraine. They, they use things to get the people going, like a color revolution or a flower revolution. So this was the Orange Revolution. It was funded and orchestrated by the networks of George Soros, and it put their man in there. They had the Rose Revolution in um, uh, Georgia, where they put their guy in there. Uh, they tried to get a Green Revolution after the last election in Iran, but it didn't stick. They have Iraq, they've taken that over. If they take Syria, then they're all the way through to Israel. They've, they've, they're in Afghanistan, they're now undermining Pakistan and bombing Pakistan more and more. In Kyrgyzstan, we had the Tulip Revolution. We just had another one recently, putting their people um, into power. We've had the terrorism starting to unfold in India. And they are targeting these areas because they not only want to take it over, they want to trigger a war involving China and Russia, the Third World War that their documents have talked about for a long time. And they're ticking them off. And if you take that map of Eurasia and keep it in your pocket, you'll tick them off as the news stories unfold. Oh, a revolution here. Oh, a coup here. And what they're doing, this is not America doing this. This is not America doing this. This is the cabal doing this through America. The idea is to destroy America, to use America to destroy America. Why? Because when you want a world government dictatorship, you cannot have any superpowers that have the military and financial might to say no to what you're saying must happen. Because the uh, world government intends to have a world army, a, a world central bank, and a world currency, eventually. And they'll manipulate the financial situation to, to bring that about, or try to. So what they need to do to take the superpower America out is they need to destroy it militarily, and they need to destroy it financially. And that's what they're doing. They're using it on their foreign excursions, and they're undermining its economy to destroy America. And it is going down the pan so fast. And this guy is being used as the front man. Nice smile. Oh, he's a nice man. That's what's really happening. <laughs> Behind a smile. Just hand it on. It wasn't change. There we go. Here's the ball. Make sure you keep the drugs running in Afghanistan, you know, drop some my way. And what we saw was a presidential problem reaction solution. Bush was brought in to create problems, financial problems, overseas wars problems, and this guy was brought in as the solution to the problems. And as Adolf Hitler said, the great masses of the people will more easily fall victims to the big lie than the small one. So, I am someone to believe in. Hope, which is always in the future, never in the now, and uh, so it never actually comes to fruition, but we can hope it does. And then you had change you can believe in. And none of these trite phrases like change were ever described in detail about what they actually meant. And what they created was a massive mind control coup on vast tracts of American people because they made Obama a blank screen, an empty suit on which people could project what they felt hope and change was, their version of it, onto him. And once he became uh, president, of course, everything was changed. Make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. I love you, you love me, I will get you stuff for free. Oh, yay, Obama, you are such a star. I love this one. The wolf found that shepherd's clothing worked better. The peace president, first thing he did was agree the uh, bombing of Pakistan. Same guy, all this going on with this spent uranium, pleated uranium. 
What does he do? Continues the bombing, increases the troops. Fraud, another puppet. Golden rule, big time. Ignore the words and watch the actions, because they're never the same. And just to show you nothing's changed, there we go. Good old Bono. Nothing's changed, we're fine. So, we have this projected agenda, and we're now at the point where they're trying to introduce, finally, that structure. World government, world central bank, world army, and world currency, eventually. And alongside it, of course, the Orwellian state that I've been writing about for the best part of 20 years, and uh, increasingly, uh, so many others have too over the years, and it's unfolding uh, as daily experience. More and more control. Now, number plate imagery, where they can follow people all over the country. This stuff called speed spike, where they can follow cars and their speeds from satellite wherever they go over vast distances. Then they've got this stuff they're bringing in, problem reaction solution, because some puppet stooge kid uh, set his pants on fire and now we must have this stuff. You know, I don't care about them seeing my body, serves them right. But it's, um, <laughs> it's gonna bathe us all in bloody uh, uh, radiation. And of course, people who do care about their body being seen, it's going to, again, break them down. This is what it's about. It's a psychological warfare on the people. We're seeing police becoming more like soldiers. There are some good policemen. There are some sensible policemen. But my god, there's some morons. And they're giving them tasers as well. Bloody hell. 55,000 volts. And what is that about? People say, oh, it's terrible. It's bad for them, isn't it, that these people are dying from being hit by the taser? No, it's what they want. Because when people die of being hit by the taser, that means anything you say, anything you say, officer, I'll do. It's, a, so it's what they want. It's part of the control system. And the sound to clear peaceful protest, the microchip agenda goes on. One hospital now is replacing written tags on babies with barcoded ones in the papers this week. It's all on the road. They now have barcodes that actually you can't see. The real ones, they would be there, but you wouldn't see them. Then there's the assault on the body computer to destabilize our ability to maximize our potential and get out there to higher levels of consciousness. That's what, uh, in part, this is about. The chemtrails that crisscross the skies all over the world. All the chemical cocktails in food and drink targeting children, most of all. And this is an interesting thing. It's talk about problem, reaction, solution. The symptoms of the e-numbers in sweets and food and everything in terms of childhood behavior problems mirror the alleged symptoms of attention deficit disorder. Mirror them. Why? Because they're causing them. And so what they do is have this shite, have this shite, this will chemically imbalance the brain it will create behavior problems and attention problems, and then we'll give you freaking Ritalin to dose you in mind-changing drugs to meet the problem that we are causing here. Same with uh, genetically modified food, which is there to genetically modify us. This is why they're more and more targeting organic farmers around the world and people growing their own food to overcome the chemical shite. This is why they're targeting small farmers so the great conglomerations can move in like Monsanto and others. This is why they have this Codex Alimentarius which was created by Nazis like Fritz Tamir who uh, came up with the work makes free sign across the entrance to Auschwitz. Him and some of his fellow Nazis who went to jail after Nuremberg, he was released well ahead of the end of his sentence because his mate intervened called Nelson Rockefeller, four times mayor of New York, and they created these Nazis, Codex Alimentarius in the 60s, means code, uh, food book or food code, and now they're trying to introduce, impose global regulations which in effect will stop us getting the doses of food supplements and vitamins that make any difference, and also hand control over to the pharmaceutical cartel for it. Same with the attempt to get us vaccinated with all this shite through the uh, Rothschild-created and controlled World Health Organization. And because of the web, this center point can control the, the Monsantos, the food producers, the food standards agencies, which are supposed to oversee those people, the drug companies, the Food and Drug Administration in America is supposed to oversee them. They can orchestrate all of the stuff that I've just described and listed because of this web. And the overall thing is a, uh, a war on the human immune system. 
They're trying to undermine the human immune system in every way, shape, or form because they want a massive cull of the world population because they cannot cope with the numbers. And like I say, I was reading, well, when I was researching the book, I saw incredible figures. But my goodness, in the last week, I've seen extraordinary figures in terms of the increase in drugs, mind altering drugs given to children. It is fantastic. And it's being done systematically to dumb down young people and stop them expressing their true potential for consciousness, which they are. And all that is in here, how that was going to happen, written as a novel by this guy, Fabian Aldous Huxley. They're putting us in a vibrational prison in all these ways. The financial crash was orchestrated on purpose by deregulating, and it's possible to do that because the Rothschilds and their associated families and groups control the world financial system. They're moving trillions of dollars around, so they decide if the stock market goes up or it goes down. If uh, they target the dollar, it will go down. If they target sterling, it will go down or, or, or whatever, because they have that ability, and Goldman Sachs is one of their main vehicles for all this stuff. And they can control the world financial system because, once again, same, they control the banks, they control the Federal Reserve System in America, they control the Bank of England, and they control governments, and they control the reporting of it. Uh, and this is the plan. Stage one, crash the global economy, September 2008. Stage two, governments throw fantastic amounts of money, credit, money that doesn't exist, but we pay interest on it, at the perpetrators until their financial barrels are empty. Stage three, and they'll bring this when they feel it's going to have maximum impact, they're going to crash the economy again on unprecedented scale when governments have no means to respond. That's the idea. Why? Well, the, the last section will, will kind of pull all this together because there's something going on which they want to stop. But that's the idea. The more uh, fear, the more disruption, the more stress, the more worry that they can create, the more it impacts upon us in ways that suit the control system, as I've described through the day. And then there's this major element of their uh, plan in the next few years, is introduce massive taxation and control and imposition um, as a result of something that doesn't exist, thanks to this guy. If this guy's involved, it's a scam. End of story. End of story. Here you go. Thanks for the Oscar, but I'm totally full of crap. This man's going around demonizing carbon dioxide, which without it, the world would not be as it is, and demonizing the greenhouse effect, without which we wouldn't bloody be here. There you go. That's what he's doing. And he's orchestrating all these people. And oh, it's so kind, so kind that David de Rothschild has produced this book to help us, Global Warming Survival Handbook. Survival, survival. Now, let's get some sanity into this. This is a graph of greenhouse gases that make up the greenhouse effect. That one, you would think, from the propaganda, would be carbon dioxide. It is water vapor and clouds. I think we ought to ban water vapor and clouds. It's the only way to save the freaking world, right? Every time we see a cloud, they ought to add VAT. I think it's the only bloody way. And this is carbon dioxide. Not only that, the gray stuff is natural. Only the green slither is coming from human activity. And we're supposed to believe it's affecting the weather. It's the bloody sun. When the sun it's the bloody sun. When the sun is in an active phase, it gets warmer. When it's in a, a non-active phase, it gets cooler, which is why over the last 10, 11 years, when the sun's been in a non-active phase, it's got cooler year on year. And one of these groups in this network with Brzezinski's Trilateral Commission is the Club of Rome. It was created in the 60s to orchestrate the use of the environment to push the agenda. Aurelio Pecci, the founder of the Club of Rome, quoted it in their own publication in 1991. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like, would fit the bill. And they've played it out ever since through the Church of Climatology, which is just a cult. And here's the high priest. And we have this guy, Nick Clegg, 
who actually calls people that challenge the global warming climate change official story as climate change deniers. Because the Church of Climatology uh, says that if you don't accept its nonsense, you are a blasphemer! And they equate you with Holocaust deniers. That's what that line is supposed to do. And we're still pushing along. We've had Climate Gate, we've had Glacier Gate, we've had Amazon Gate, we've had Polar Bear Gate, Rising Sea Levels Gate, where all these things that were supposed to be happening have found to be not happening and have been lied about and manufactured. And we've even had Cowgate. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you glad tidings and great news. These clowns have now admitted that bovine flatulence is not a threat to human existence as we know it. I can't, I can't tell you how happy I am. BBC, through gritted teeth, has had to admit on its website, but not on its television station, that temperatures have been falling. And yet, no matter, the green team goes in, Gore's team is taken on by Obama. They go around programming children about fear of the future. The green police to impose checks on your houses without your permission. And just to show it's a scam, there we go. How's that? Good stuff. <laughs> Again, I keep coming back to this. The suppression vibrationally of this energy field and the human energy field. The reason they're stopping the manufacturing of light bulbs and the selling of light bulbs as we've known them up to this point and they're replacing them with these things which are full of mercury and an environmental bloody disaster is because they give off a certain vibration that affects the human energy field. This is why many people around the world get ill, physically ill, when they live with these light bulbs. It's all a scam. Very quickly to finish, political correctness. This is not about protecting minorities. It's about stopping people speaking their truth and having freedom of speech. That's what it's about. It's about creating what Orwell called new speak, where um, the language replaces old speak, words that have meaning and detail and you can express yourself, with new speak, which actually says nothing, has no ability to express detail. Uh, because of the, the way it works. The only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year, Orwell said. And as he pointed out quite rightly, on the conscious level, we think in words. And so the more you reduce the words, and all this tech stuff, you are, and all this stuff, and, and the way we're, we're, we're changing the language and reducing it dramatically, is taking out over, over, over a periods, the ability to even think in detail, as one uh, person said, how can you um, talk about freedom and how we must have freedom if there's no word left that really means freedom? And in, in 1984, of course, Newspeak um, didn't have a word meaning freedom. This is what political correctness is about, shutting people up so no one can say anything. You mustn't upset anybody. Well, it upsets me. You've upset me by saying I can't upset anybody. If I can't upset anybody, I can't say anything. It doesn't matter what you bloody say, you'll upset somebody. And then we have, then we have um, health and safety. <laughs> Again, it's to create a situation where people can't move. I went into a pizza hut on the Isle of Wight. I'm not proud of it, I was hungry. But, <laughs> And I asked, I asked for a cup of coffee. And they said they couldn't make me a cup of coffee because the coffee machine was broken. I said, can't you, true story. I said, can't you put the kettle on? They said, no, we can't use a kettle because of health and safety. It's a bloody cafe. <laughs> Do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. Oh, thanks for that, mate. I, I might have made a mistake there. And what all this is, is brilliantly portrayed here by Neil Haig, all these things, taxation, you can't do this, you can't do that, don't say that, health and safety, political correctness, oh, watch what you're thinking, oh, watch what you say, oh, my God, is to tie us like um, flies in the spider's web so we can't move. We've got people worrying now about, is me wheelie bin out on the wrong day? Is it a few inches too near the curb? And you know something, and, and this is important, these people are taking the piss, and I'll tell you why. They 
are throwing this crap at us, and if they don't meet significant resistance, they go, okay, we'll throw even more crap.